Good morning. I need to begin this morning with a public service announcement. It's very important. It's for the young women in the audience here at CPAC. Uh, in spite of media reports that he is about to be back on the market for the first time in years, we urge you to stay away from Congressman Alan Grayson. His charms are no doubt difficult to resist, but it really is for the best and for your own safety, allegedly. On a related note, I actually heard a rumor that Grayson is just one ugly outburst away from automatically qualifying for his very own weekend show on MSNBC. <laughs> and I'm not even talking about lockup. Working title, Fifty Shades of Grayson. Quite frankly, I'm not even sure if their tens of viewers are prepared for that. Then again, the source of this whole rumor was Harry Reid, so it's probably complete BS. So I, it was tough to tell from backstage. Were you guys slightly fired up by Senator Cruz? Yeah? Very good. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker this morning, who's lived through an eventful five years. Among other things, he was the Republican's point man in exposing the faulty math and bogus promises of Obamacare. A left-wing attack ad depicted him literally wheeling an elderly woman off of a cliff. That was punishment for the sin, apparently, of advancing a credible bipartisan plan to save Medicare from looming insolvency, which is an empirically undeniable crisis for which the so-called party of science is utterly bereft of solutions, and perhaps most challenging, he debated a deranged person for 90 minutes on national television in front of 51 million Americans and somehow managed to emerge with his dignity intact. He's an indispensable asset for modern conservatism, a policy innovator, and a solutions-oriented wonk with, and I quote, dreamy blue eyes. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Paul Ryan of Wisconsin. Hey, everybody. Hey, folks, how are you doing? Great to see you. Good morning. Guy, thanks. Uh, what can I say about that introduction? Well, it's the most recent introduction I've received. <laughs> you know, when Al Cardenas asked me to speak this year, he said, Paul, I like to save the best for last. So you're up first thing Thursday morning. <laughs> well, all I can say is it's great to be back. Thanks again, everybody. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Now, the 2012 election didn't go exactly as we had planned it. <laughs> Last year, I gotta tell you, it was pretty tough to be optimistic after a loss like that. A year later, I think there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic. <clears throat> you know why? I think the left is exhausted. Our side is energized. And on election day, we're going to win. <clears throat> Take the president. He released his budget this week. And from the looks of it, he is just doubling down. He is moving further to the left. His teammates aren't much better. You notice they all kind of sound alike these days? All they talk about is income inequality. They say it shows party unity. But what it really shows is that they're out of ideas. The reason they keep talking about income inequality is because they cannot talk about economic growth. They have spent five long years in power and all they have to show for it is this lousy website. <laughs> <clears throat> the president was remarkably candid when he said he was going to tr fundamentally transform the country. He's done his best to keep that pledge. In the end, I think he's going to fail. <clears throat> you see, now that the president is implementing his agenda, it is a total fiasco. Big government 
big government sounds good in theory, but it looks a lot different in practice. And we are learning this the hard way. This, this is our opportunity. For the president and his allies, this campaign will not be a sprint, or, will not be a sprint or a marathon. It's gonna be a 50 yard dash. They're going to run from their record. They're going to point fingers and they're going to try and make us the villain in their morality play. <clears throat> I don't think it's going to work because they're going to overreach. Take just one example. The little sisters of the poor. The administration is trying to force a group of nuns to violate their conscience. The left isn't trying to solve a problem here. They're trying to make a point. They're in charge. And if you don't like it, deal with it. Look, I've been in politics long enough to know that if you throw your weight around like this, you will get thrown out of office. That is not just how a majority party acts. A majority party welcomes debate. It brings people in. It doesn't burn heretics. It wins converts. And it knows people don't want to be pandered to. They want to be treated like adults. They want to be convinced. They want to be inspired. That's why I'm excited about our team. The way the left tells it, the Republican Party is in this big, massive civil war. It's Tea Party versus establishment, libertarians versus social conservatives. There's infighting, conflict, backbiting, discord. Look, I'm Irish. That's my idea of a family reunion. I don't see this great divide in our party. What I see is a vibrant debate. We are figuring out the best way to apply our principles to the challenges of the day. Sure, we have our disagreements. And yes, they can get a little passionate. I like to think of it as creative tension. <laughs> For the most part, these disagreements have not been over principles or even policies. They've been over tactics. So I think we should give each other the benefit of the doubt. <clears throat> but, but we, we, your representatives, we have to earn this benefit of the doubt. We have to offer a vision. We have to explain where we want to take the country and how we want to get there. Now there's a fine line between being pragmatic and being unprincipled. And sometimes, sometimes it's hard to tell who's here to start a career and who's here to serve a cause. But the true test is not which specific path you take, it's whether you move the country in the right direction. And we will. Look, from our governors in the states, to our members in Congress, to the Tea Party groups across the country, a conservative, modern reform agenda is now taking shape. We are offering a vision, and we have got plenty of ideas. You're about to hear from one of our leaders, Senator Tim Scott. <clears throat> Take what Tim Scott and Leader Eric Kanner are doing. They've said, sure, let's make things a little more equal. Let's let every parent choose where their child goes to school. Because we believe to help every child get ahead, every parent should get a choice. Take Senator Mike Lee, Congressman Tom Graves. They want to give states more control over our highways so that they can build the roads they need. Because we believe families should spend less time in traffic and more time at home. Take Senator Marco Rubio. He wants to repair our safety net. He wants to streamline those government programs and give working families a boost. Because we believe, in this country, it should always pay to work. We believe in the dignity of work. <laughs> Take Congresswoman Martha Roby. She's got a great idea. If you work overtime, you should be able to take more time off, paid time off, if you want to. Because we believe that working parents know best how to manage their own time, and Washington should just stand, get out of the way. Take Chairman Dave Camp. He wants to lower tax rates for businesses and families. Right now, 
the tax code is 10 times the size of the Bible and has none of the good news. <laughs> Here's the way it works. You send your money to Washington, and if you do what Washington tells you to do, you can get some of your money back. I got a better idea. Why don't you just keep your money in the first place? Yeah. Yeah. Take Obamacare. The way the president tells it, okay, don't take Obamacare, but just work with me, okay? <laughs> Consider Obamacare. The way the president talks, you'd think there's no alternative. We've got plenty. Senator Tom Coburn has one. Congressman Phil Rowe has one. Tom Price has one. Each plan has its virtues, but the unifying principle is clear. We believe you should pick your health care plan, not Washington. Once again, the GOP is where the action is. Just as it was in Jack Kemp's day at the beginning of the Reagan Revolution. You know, people forget that cutting taxes was once controversial, even in our own party. Senator Bob Dole used to make fun of supply siders like Jack. He used to say, the good news is a busload of supply siders went over a cliff. The bad news is a few seats were empty. Guess what? Over time, he warmed to the idea. And when he ran for president, he promised to cut tax rates across the board. That's what we call the battle of ideas. I saw this with my own budget. When I introduced my budget for the first time in 2008, I had just eight co-sponsors. Eight conservative backbenchers willing to stick their neck out. The political pros told everybody to stay away. Then. The Tea Party members got elected, and now the House has passed it three years in a row. <clears throat> this is how it always is. You fight it out. You figure out what works. You come together. Then you win. It's messy. It's noisy. And it's a little bit uncomfortable. But the center of gravity is shifting. We are not just opposing a president. We are developing an agenda, a modern pro-growth principled agenda for our party. We are going to show the country that there is a better way. You know, the way I see it, let the other party be the party of personalities. We will be the party of ideas. <clears throat> I'm optimistic about our chances because the left the left isn't just out of ideas, they're out of touch. Take Obamacare, not literally, but figuratively here, okay? <clears throat> we now know that this law will discourage millions of people from working. The left thinks this is a good thing. <laughs> they say, hey, this is a new freedom, the freedom not to work. <laughs> I don't think the problem is too many people are working, I think the problem is not enough people can find work. And if people leave the workforce, our economy will shrink. There will be less opportunity, not more. The left is making a big mistake here. What they're offering people is a full stomach and an empty soul. The American people want more than that. You know, this reminds me of a story I heard from Eloise Anderson. She serves in the cabinet of my buddy, Governor Scott Walker. <clears throat> She once met a young boy from a very poor family. And every day at school, he would get a free lunch from a government program. He told Eloise he didn't want a free lunch. He wanted his own lunch, one in a brown paper bag, just like the other kids. He wanted one, he said, because he knew a kid with a brown paper bag had someone who cared for him. This is what the left does not understand. We don't want people to leave the workforce. We want them to share their skills and their talents with the rest of us. People don't just want a life of comfort. They want a life of dignity. They want a life of self-determination. 
A life of equal outcomes is not nearly as enriching as a life of equal opportunity. I tell you, the party that speaks to that desire, the party that tries to make it concrete and real, that's the party that will win in November. We are that party. <clears throat> we are that party because that is the country that we know. And in a few years, I think we're going to look back at all of this creative tension. I think we're going to look back at 2014 as the time when we got it right, when we gave the country a real choice, when we earned back the people's trust. That's the moment we are in right now. This is the party that's forming. This is the battle of ideas that's happening. And this is the party that's going to do this so that we can finally save the American idea. Thank you very much for your participation here. This is here. It is now. We are coming together and we're going to do this. And you're here to help us. And we're going to look back at this time when we saved it. Thank you, everybody, and God bless. Thank you.